In 1990, the coastal calm of San Diego was shattered by a series of brutal murders. They were all being killed with knives. They were all being displayed on their backs. A killer who shadowed his prey with systematic stealth. He's just lying in wait, targeting these women, you know, whether it's in the health club, whether it's in the pool. When the third one happened, it was like, bingo, we've got a serial killer. And he would strike when they were at their most vulnerable. She's alone. She's in the shower. The knife went all the way through her body and out her back. The killer watched her die. The most terrifying moments in the history of cinema is the shower scene in the movie Psycho. But who was behind these twisted attacks? And was he born to kill? He's controlled by the devil as far as I'm concerned, and um, he's going to burn in hell. And here's what's happening at 5. A young woman has been stabbed to death. Her body found in the same Claremont area where two other women were murdered over the past four months. The victim is believed to be in her 20s. Now, this latest murder is making a lot of people nervous. April 1990. The city of San Diego was gripped by fear. I just want to get the hell out of here. It's not worth it. I do carry a stun gun now but everybody's gonna have to carry guns or stand guns to protect themselves. At the Buena Vista Apartments in the Claremont area of the city, a third young woman had been found stabbed. It's too much, this has happened too many times. The young woman who had been attacked was 18-year-old Holly Ann Tarr. She was a graduating senior from a high school in Michigan, a very sweet girl. Uh, involved in music with her school and a very, very good student. Along with her friend Tammy, Holly had come to San Diego to visit her brother before starting college. It's so exciting to think, you know, you're going to college next year. You know, I want to try Broadway. That's, that's one of my main goals. And I want to, I want to try TV. Movies really interest me, too. She was a uh, high school student that was in the San Diego area visiting her brother over her spring break. Holly and her friend had been at the pool. Holly went back to freshen up because she was going to take a shower and go shopping with her brother. And her friend said, well, I'll come back after you do and just leave the door open. This was theirs right up here. When Tammy went in to take her shower, the door was locked. She heard a scream. She got the uh, maintenance guy to come to the door. We were able to break open the door, and the offender was in, in the apartment with Holly Tara at the time. So then here comes this guy with a knife running at me. And I backed up and fell down, and he come uh, running out. I tried to kick him down the stairs as he... And he ran down, and I, didn't, I don't think I even touched him. I was, I was scared. And so he, he came flying out of the apartment and ran down this way. It was the first time anyone had laid eyes on the brutal murderer who, for the last four months, had been terrorizing the area. Tammy said he was definitely a black guy. And then we later interviewed more people that saw him run and it said definitely a black guy. Not only had witnesses caught a glimpse of the murderer, he left crucial evidence as he ran from the apartment. We found that the t-shirt in these bushes right here, the knife was found over here, and this was all mud, and the footwear impression was found here that we lifted. In the apartment, the scene that greeted police was horrifying. Holly suffered one wound to the chest. The knife went all the way through her body and at her back. The killer watched her die. 
and he dripped blood on her crotch. And the body was posed. She was found naked, lying on her back with her arms and legs spread in a star formation. And Holly wasn't the first to be victimized by such a brutal attack. Three homicides had occurred all in the same apartment complex, all at relatively the same time, between 10 in the morning till 2 in the afternoon. They were all being killed with knives. They were all being displayed on their backs. You could almost put a, a map over each one, and each one was posed the same way. Holly's murder brought the total of victims to three. For residents and investigators alike, there was no longer any doubt that a serial killer was stalking the neighborhood. They kind of started putting it together because of his signature, because of what he did with the knife and the blood and the stuff. And then when the third one happened, it was like, bingo, we've got a serial killer. Everybody was real worried. Locking doors, keeping their eyes out, being more aware of what was going on. Everybody was up in arms after that. A lot of fear, a lot of hysteria. Uh, not only the print media in San Diego were covering it aggressively, but the TV stations were all over it. I mean, they were, they were all over the Buena Vista Gardens apartment complex, uh, interviewing all of these women. And there was just this growing sense of uh, paranoia and outrage about the whole thing. As police struggled to contain the situation, they would soon learn that the savage murders were anything but opportunistic. The killer was stalking his prey and striking when there was no escape. In April 1990, 18-year-old Holly Tarr had been brutally slain at her brother's apartment in San Diego. It was a tragic end for a high school graduate who had been drawn to the area by the promise of paradise. San Diego is at the southern tip of Southern California. It borders Mexico. And uh, San Diego is a fascinating place. Robert and Robin Romo were attracted to the Buena Vista apartments in the city's vibrant Claremont district. They had a lot of parks and beaches and stuff like that where, you know, families all went and interacted with each other every day. Very friendly neighbors. Yeah, it was very nice. There were very nice people there. In 1989, a new neighbor moved in. Cleophas Prince Jr. had relocated to San Diego from Alabama. He was just quiet, real mellow guy. I mean, I was comfortable with him. I let him in the house. He was a friend of Tony's, their roommate. Mm -hmm. And he would come over and they would go work out. You could tell that working out was his life. I mean, he did, when you touched on that subject, he came alive. Prince grew up far from the idyllic blue skies and surf of San Diego. Born in 1967, he was raised in the Gate City Projects in Birmingham. We're in the Gate City neighborhood now. If you see to your right, that's actually the project area. We normally have problems in this neighborhood right here. From a young age, he was exposed to the troubles of the poverty-stricken community. A lot of people being uh, hurt on this street, fights, all kind of stuff has happened here. You know, I don't give up on anybody because there's still some good people out here. There's a lot of good people out here, you know, just making bad choices. But the influence of the streets would be surpassed by the impact of his father, who just two years after Prince's birth, shot and killed a man. His father served time in prison for a manslaughter charge. On an almost weekly basis until he was 12, Prince would visit his father in prison. He could have viewed the establishment as taking his father from him. His father claimed it was self-defense, so that could translate into how his son, uh, Cleophas, would see, you know, the whole system. He grew up poor and black in rural Alabama. 
uh, not exactly known as a citadel of liberalism when it comes to race. In an effort to escape his surroundings, Prince saw military service as his ticket out of the ghetto. And in 1987, he was posted 2,000 miles west in San Diego. When he joined the Navy, he was sent here, and this is where he was based. Is, and it's a, a pretty good sized base. The military offered him, I guess, a bit of a, an escape from his background. Three years later, the terror that gripped Claremont's condominiums began with an attack on 20-year-old student Tiffany Page Schultz. She was a, a college student trying to work her way through college. She lived in the Canyon Ridge complex, if I recall, which was across from Buena Vista Gardens. All the, the lighter colored ones over here, this is Canyon Ridge. A manager said that a gentleman had approached her at one point and asked for a coat hanger. He said that uh, he had locked himself out of his car and he needed a coat hanger to get back in. But she was puzzled by the fact that he didn't head toward his car. He actually headed toward uh, the apartment complex. Tiffany had been sunbathing on the balcony of her apartment complex. She was brutally attacked, I think drug inside, fear, and she put up one hell of a fight to try and get away, and unfortunately she didn't make it. She had multiple stab wounds all over her body. Some of them were defensive wounds, but she had a cluster of stab wounds in her chest. It's unusual to have that many stab wounds. I think she had well over 50 stab wounds. The unprecedented murder shook the community. And with such a brutal attack on their hands, investigators were baffled by the lack of evidence at the crime scene. Guys were, were doing interviews, neighborhood canvassing and that kind of stuff, but nothing really popped out at anybody at that point. The case was being worked, but really no leads. You're always in the back of your mind thinking, God, I hope we don't have another one. But just four weeks later, police were called back to the Claremont District and to the Buena Vista apartment of 21-year-old student Janine Weinhold. Janine had dropped off her roommate uh, at work. She was a very bright young woman, uh, very idealistic, uh, very committed to helping others, came from a wonderful family. Just one of these incredibly giving, kind, sweet human beings. She was doing her laundry and doing things around her apartment, around the complex, and uh, then she was going to go and pick up the roommate and she never did show up. Janine's roommate called police. I was with my homicide team. We were at headquarters and we got the call. When we did get notified, um, you're thinking, well, number one, what are we gonna have? You know, what are we gonna do? Janine's apartment is uh, the one on the top, the, where the vents are, that was a living room. So you went up the stairs, go into the apartment, and you're looking around. As you walk in, there was a laundry basket that still had damp clothes in it, and we think that she was carrying the laundry basket up, probably braced it on a knee or something, and opened the door, and he followed her in. She was found in this bedroom right here. She'd been stabbed, sexually assaulted, and posed. Like Tiffany Schultz before her, Janine had the same vicious circular stabbing pattern to her left breast and had been arranged with arms and legs splayed. What was shocking about that particular crime is how many times she was stabbed. I mean, it, it, was, it was such a savage crime and, um, you know, the victim was so young and people were horrified by it. Twice now, the killer had demonstrated an unusually twisted M.O. The stabbing pattern, it's definitely a signature of his. A classic sunburst kind of stabbing pattern. He had this thing that we call pickerism, where he would stab in a concentric circle over the left breast, and these, these 
sort of shallow and then deep stabs, um, that's what, what he would do to his victims. So that would indicate a paraphilia of some kind of ritual, something that that, that particular mode of attacking his victims satisfies something psychological in him. Stabbing in a circular fashion right over a heart is important as well. Remember, these guys are not functioning solely on symbolism. There's also a practicality to their behavior as well. And he wanted to make sure that they were dead, did not want to leave any victims around that could possibly have identified him. But this time, the killer had sexually assaulted his victim. We spent probably two full days at the crime scene. We recovered. Um, a significant amount of uh, blood and semen. We tried to get every possible piece of evidence that we could. Why we were doing the crime scene, um, the answering machine was left on because we want to see if anybody's going to call and her mom and dad were calling probably every 15 minutes begging for her to call them and that was pretty sad. It's kind of a deal where you look at the victim and you go, I'm going to find your killers. With two almost identical murders within just three blocks of each other, investigators and residents feared the worst. Everybody was on guard after that. It, was, uh, it just wasn't expected. Not where we lived in that part of Claremont. That just didn't happen. I mean, it wasn't a place where you had to lock your doors. And the first time that I heard about the murders, my doors were locked and my windows were kept closed. At that point, the police are essentially labeling the crime possible serial killing. Then the whole city is in shock. You know, you're thinking it in the back of your mind, OK, I think we have one guy that's doing this. But you still have to keep an open mind. It could be two guys or whatever. We didn't know if it was male, female, you know, what nationality, big, small, little, fat, skinny. We had no idea. Six weeks later, the third murder in the Claremont district would unearth a clue. The brutal slaying of Holly Tarr at the Buena Vista Apartments bore eyewitnesses. We knew we had a black guy. We knew an approximate height and weight uh, and build. So we started scouring the area for anybody that would match that. The race was on to catch the brutal killer, but investigators were unaware that the predator not only stalked the residents of Claremont, he also lived among them. By April 1990, three women had been ferociously stabbed to death in their apartments in the Claremont area of San Diego. With nothing but a vague description to go on, investigators turned to the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit for a profile of their elusive killer. I was contacted and uh, asked if I would be able to take a look at those cases to see if I thought they were, might be related. With three nearly identical murders, profilers had all the information they needed. We determined that it was the same offender. They were all being killed with knives. They were all being displayed on their backs. So the concern that I had at that point was that we did, in fact, have a serial killer at work that's taking and he's stabbing these women in the center of the chest multiple times. The depth of these wounds are like as much as six inches deep. And he's repeating that behavior over and over and over again. So it's a very... Um, that's a very disturbing thing to see. Even more terrifying was the killer's familiarity with the Claremont area. Criminals in general don't commute to their crimes. They commit crimes where they feel comfortable, and they gain a sense of comfort from familiar surroundings. He's in the area where he has what we call the mental map. He knows the area, he's familiar with it, he knows how to watch for people. The comfort zone notion is really where being a predator, you see who's around, you see what kind of police protect the place. He's a very high risk offender because he's going into occupied dwellings on the second floor during broad daylight and committing acts of murder. From the outside, it looks like it's high risk, but for him, he has a level of comfort because he's familiar with the area. Investigators had a profile and following a search of the area surrounding Holly's murder, they had a lead. There was a sign-in sheet at the pool. 
Holly and Tammy had signed in uh, earlier in the day. Looking at the logs, they saw a name there, C. Prince. The other visitor to the pool had been Buena Vista Gardens resident, Cleophas Prince, Jr. He said, well, he'd gone to work that day and didn't know anything about anything. And when asked to give up blood and fingerprints, he goes, no, I'm not going to do that. He goes, I think you're just on a witch hunt. So when somebody refuses, obviously, it, it throws up a red flag. We didn't have enough evidence to do anything with. So we put him kind of on the back burner and kept on looking. That's when things started to get weird, because he would come to our house and complain about the police want hair samples, they want blood samples, they want DNA. And I'm not giving them, they're just trying to railroad me, they're just trying to pin it on me. We're just like, well, just give them some hair samples, give them some blood, hey, well, they'll leave you alone. This was not Prince's first run-in with authorities. His former career in the Navy had been cut short. He stole something, and he was in the brig for a short time. He got a dishonorable discharge. That's when he uh, moved to the Buena Vista Garden Apartments, and then he went to work for a cable company, pulling cable. Freed from the restrictive regulations of the Navy, Prince was left to his own devices. He didn't really seem to know what to do with himself. He didn't have the structure or the protection or the oversight of the military any longer. He was on his own. He then begins to support himself with thefts. And he becomes quite clever at it, in fact, to the point where he teaches other people what he's doing. He showed us how it was orchestrated, you know, uh, socks on the hands, credit cards, anything hard that can, or a knife, could break into the lock. And um, we were in. I make sure nobody was in, you were in visual sight of anybody. That's what he had taught us. Although Prince had denied any involvement in the murder of Holly Tarr, police suspicions were rapidly mounting. Cleophas Prince lived in the Buena Vista Garden Apartments during the Tiffany Schultz, Janine Weinholt, and Holly Tarr murder. He ultimately moved, but we had no idea that he had moved. After nine months, the trail of the Claremont killer had gone cold, and the attacks seemed to have stopped. I was sitting at my desk, and I got a call from my boss in the homicide team, and he goes, you need to come up on Honors Drive. You have the scene. We have another one, and it's a double. I'm thinking, ah, oh, crap. You know, he's back. He's doing it. Is this ever going to stop? It's a terrible, terrible feeling. That, you know, we, the guy laid low for a little while, and then boom. On September 13th, 1990, investigators found themselves heading to the home of 42-year-old Pamela Clark and her daughter, Amber. There was two cars parked in the driveway. Pamela was found laying on the floor by the front door. He walked in, and she was just to the left. And Amber was at the end of the hallway. Uh, and both of them had obviously been stabbed multiple times. The position of Pamela's body told a horrifying story. I think she was in the shower, because when we got there, she had wet hair. She was naked. There was drag marks kind of from the, from the front door back to where she was posed. And a knife imprint in blood was on the door where he would have, like, slammed the door to make sure she couldn't get out. There was a ring taken from uh, Mrs. Clark. Both women were stabbed 11 times in the center of their chest. Both were displayed. Uh, the uh, uh, mother was found with her arms above her head and, her, and, and a big knife pointed at her head. Investigators meticulously combed the house looking for evidence that would hint at the identity of the killer. On Pamela and Amber Clark, we literally spent days there going through every room, uh, the whole backyard, because we did get footprints. As with the three murders before, there was no obvious sign of forced entry. He was showing a, a real skill in, in getting into places, which in terms of his criminal past, what has he done in the past, one of the things that we were talking about was that he possibly had been involved in some burglaries in the past. 
If a woman is killed or abducted in her home, there's about a 65% chance that the individual had a history of burglary. Why? Because he's comfortable doing that. Through his burglary experience, he can then break into a home and so on. For investigators, lack of evidence was stifling. You know, you here again, you're walking in and you're going, oh, God, what can we do that we haven't done, you know, to get this guy? Is there anything I could have done better? And the answer always came back, no, because, boy, I'll tell you, we just, we turned over every leaf. We, we just tried everything. But the sadistic killer was already planning his next attack. Another vulnerable victim was firmly in his sights. By September 1990, San Diego police were stymied by an enigmatic killer who had violently attacked five women in their homes. While witnesses reported an African-American man fleeing the scene of his third victim, the suspect remained at large. But five months later, there'd be an encounter that would change the face of the investigation. This is where my neighbor had lived. He was, when I'd come home from the gym, he actually was sitting there on his porch reading his paper. This was actually my apartment at the time. Geraldine and her fiance lived 15 miles from Claremont. Aware of the murders, but far from the epicenter, they felt no cause for concern. I wasn't real in tune with what was going on. I really didn't think that that would ever apply to me. My husband and I were getting married, and so I think my, I was pretty much distracted, um, you know, with preparing for that. Geraldine had spent the morning at the gym and had returned home with a day of wedding planning ahead. I got home, got undressed, um, and turned on the shower. You know, I heard something out the front. It was just kind of a little bit of a rattling noise. And I looked through the people. Um, I saw this black man who was very aggressively working my lock. And I mean, so much so, I, I felt certain he was getting in. I didn't even know if I had a second. I really didn't even know if I had that. So I quickly threw on some sweat clothes that, you know, were in my bedroom. And I ran out the back sliding glass door. After escaping the apartment, Geraldine ran to get her neighbor. What happened was, so my neighbor actually, when I came around um, and he came out, then we, we went down here. We're like standing about here. A lot of fear running through me at that point in time. They confronted the man who was still working the lock, but with only one way out, he had nowhere to run. He was pretty muscular. He wasn't real tall, though, but he was definitely very strong. He came out, and my neighbor and I were just standing right here, so he literally just walked by the front of us. I thought that he may tackle us, you know, as he's coming by. Um, I mean, I really didn't know what he was capable of doing at that point in time. He didn't stop. Once past Geraldine, he ran to his car, making a swift exit. That's when we heard his car and seen him actually drive away. He has a really loud muffler, and my neighbor says, I think that's the Claremont killer that, the, that they've been talking about on the news. Call 911. It was the first time anyone had confronted the Claremont killer. But with only a description and a city of millions, investigators were powerless. But the following day, there was a remarkable development. So I got up and I, you know, I had to go to work that morning. And uh, my... Um, my office area sat right by the window, right by the parking lot, and all of a sudden I hear the noise. It was if, almost as if somebody could have shot off a gun. It was that alarming to me because the connection was a dead match. I mean, I knew, you know, that that was him. So I look up and he's right there in front of me, dropping off the receptionist at work. In a bizarre twist of fate, the office receptionist had been driven to work by the man who had attempted to break into Geraldine's apartment. I couldn't believe that this had, you know, that this was happening. So I, I quickly pick up the card for the, for the detective. And I'm like, he's here. He's here, you need to come and get him, he's here. So I wait for the detective to come, and all of a sudden, he drives away. With a clear description of the intruder and his car, 
The information was dispatched to officers around the city, and the hunt was on. Heads up, policemen saw this car parked at the fitness center, stopped it, ultimately got him out of the car and found knives and gloves and stuff in the car and arrested him for uh, attempt burglary of Gerald Lynn's house. The man arrested at the fitness center was 24-year-old fitness fanatic Cleophas Prince Jr. But without enough evidence at that time to hold him, Prince posted bail and fled to Birmingham. At this point, Prince had left San Diego and went to Alabama to be with his parents. Certain that the Claremont killer had just been freed from custody, investigators focused on those closest to Prince. They all started to recall disturbing elements of his character. He said that, um, you know, what's exciting is to take a girl and take her in the bathtub, tie her up, have sex with her, and then just leave her there. And we were like blown away that he had said something like that. When he left, we were like, what the hell was that about? We don't, yeah. we don't know why he would bring it, because none of the conversation had anything to do with it. He just, it just kind of came out. He told one of his friends that he's dating this, uh, this mother and this daughter, and that, you know, that somebody matching that description ends up as victims in a serial killing. News of Prince's arrest began to ripple throughout the Claremont area. My brother said, you married a Claremont killer? Cleophis is the one that was killing him. I'm like, what? I'm like, what? Cleophis was killing him? Nah, oh, man, I don't believe that. He downtown right now. But investigators were focused on more than the alarming stories that were beginning to surface. You're going over and over and over stuff, and you're you're almost reinvestigating every murder. We served several search warrants. That's when we recovered uh, Holly Tarr's ring from Cleophas's girlfriend's apartment. While in custody, Prince had been forced to provide a blood sample. From there, the inevitable trail of evidence began to take shape. They linked the semen from the sexual assault on Janine Weinhold and the blood sample that he had given after his arrest in the parking lot of the Miramar Fitness Facility. Bingo, they knew they had their guy at that point. You had articles of uh, jewelry being recovered. You have witness statements. You have a, a lot of information that's the, the evidence that's tying uh, Prince to, to these different crime scenes. Authorities didn't have to wait long to bring charges against Prince. Arrested back home in Alabama for petty theft, he was extradited to San Diego. When he uh, was arrested, he had no real emotions about it. No, wasn't disturbed, wasn't flustered, wasn't emotional, wasn't remorseful. So these are some of the behaviors that indicate he probably was psychopathic. But as they prepared for trial, investigators would discover yet another horrifying piece of the puzzle. This is the 5 o'clock edition of News 8. He's accused of five murders. Now he's charged with a sixth. Good evening. Even more charges have been filed against Cleophas Prince, the man accused of being the Claremont killer. In 1991, Prince had been arrested in Alabama. As prosecutors prepared for trial, FBI profilers spotted Prince's signature pattern of assault in a cold case from May 1990, just four weeks after the murder of Holly Tarr. We're en route to the Elisa Keller scene. I got called to view the scene. There's a significant uh, mileage difference from where the other women were killed. And the, the whole thing was a little bit different. Different, but no less horrifying. We can't get in there, but it was up there. She was found in her bedroom. She uh, obviously stabbed. She was beaten to the point that you could really see she was beaten. Had her ring stolen. Uh, she was on the floor kind of posed, but not exactly like uh, the other ones. 
We knew that the suspect had climbed through an open window and that he attacked Elisa. Elisa was a lot different than the other victim. She was older, bigger. She lived in the apartment with a daughter who was not there that particular day. I personally think that Cleophas was gonna attack the daughter, not knowing that mom was there. But when he found daughter not there, so he attacked Elisa and killed her. Once I got the case materials, um, I instantly knew that this was our guy at work again. We had the same pattern of wounds to the center of the chest. Depth of wounds was, was there. It was clear his uh, signature was there at the scene. Investigators later discovered that Prince had moved from Claremont to just a quarter of a mile from Alyssa's. Because the heat was on in Buena Vista, I mean, the cops, you couldn't turn around without running into a cop. So I think that's the reason he moved here. During the trial, Prince listened in silence as the stack of damning evidence was presented in great detail to an open court. Eight months after opening arguments, Prince stared blankly as the judge handed down the death penalty. Then the killer broke his silence and turned to face the families of the women he'd slain. I did not kill any of y'all daughters. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. There's a lot, a, lot, a lot of evidence in my case to show that I did not kill y'all daughters. I, I feel for all y'all, y'all daughters passed away. The news media say I have no feelings inside. I cried. I've seen the pictures of y'all daughters, the way they was, the way they got tormented and everything. It hurted me just like it hurt y'all. But I did not kill y'all daughters. It would be a position he would maintain even to friends visiting him in jail. I had to see his face. I had, you know, I didn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And when I got there, I asked him, what's going on, man? Did you do these things? With a blank face, he told me, no. I don't know what you're talking about. Too much points at him, man, you know, sorry to say. If he was innocent, this was the greatest frame in the world. The greatest frame. Never admitting his guilt, Prince would protest his innocence from prison. I just wanted the public to know that I am innocent. Even though I am found guilty, I am innocent. I have not killed no one. I am not no Claremont killer. I am not no crazy man. I sleep good every night. Never had problems sleeping. Because I know I haven't touched my life. If you're looking for the truth from a serial sexual murderer, you're looking in the wrong area. These guys lie pathologically. They lie when they don't have to lie. You can't believe anything someone like Prince or any serial sexual murderer says. They lie because it gives them a sense of control and domination. And this sense of control was played out in the vicious premeditation of Prince's attacks. He's just kind of lying in wait targeting these women you know whether it's in the health club whether it's in the pool or whether he's just observing them around the apartment complex he would park in this area and watch the entrance and then when women would come out he'd follow them, like a predator waiting for his next victim he seemed to know exactly when to attack he seemed to know when they would be alone in these apartments, not only alone, but perhaps in the shower. And we, matter of fact, were wondering if he could hear the water running in the apartments, and that's when he would make his entry. And you could. Uh, we turned the water on and stood down on the landing or the first floor, and you could hear the water coming through the pipes. Let's be honest, one of the most terrifying moments in the history of cinema is the shower scene in the movie Psycho. And, uh, you know, I think a person feels very vulnerable at a time like that. You know, uh, she's alone, she's in the shower. But it was Prince's choice of victims that would mark him as an anomaly. The majority of cases of serial killers was race on race. But you still have to realize that there are exceptions, so you have to be open to it. It's actually uncommon for serial killers to kill outside of their race. And I'm not sure that anyone actually has an answer to why it's done unless it's about anger issues or resentment. 
I would not say that because Prince killed white women, he hated white women. I wouldn't say that at all. Um, it may have nothing to do with racial animosity whatsoever. What then drove Prince to commit these hideous acts? It certainly could be simply a matter of resentment. He sees these women who have more than him. He might feel vulnerable and insecure um, and powerless, and you want to go after uh, the people he thinks already victimized him. In these sorts of cases, the multiple stab wounds, the body posing, those are all sexual equivalents. The violence is a discharge of their sexuality. I think it was just a, a pure rage, sexual rage kind of thing that he was been probably thinking about and that he acted out on those feelings and unfortunately he took him out on our victims. But I'm no shrink either. All I am is a cop. But were these motivations forged in his upbringing or was Cleophas Prince Jr. a born killer? How does one become a serial killer? Uh, what kind of influences are there that make you go that direction? Uh, it, it's a question that many experts wrestle with, and certainly, uh, you know, the genetics might play a role, the environment might play a role. There's just so many, so many things that could go in play here, and it's a very challenging question and a very difficult one to, to answer. He led a fairly normal life. He blended in completely with everybody else. He had a long time committed girlfriend. He was articulate. Uh, he presented himself very well. He was friendly and outgoing. And there was no way any type of red flag uh, was raised. He seemed completely normal. There seems to be nothing in his life that would motivate the murders in particular. So he comes close to being somebody who developed into a killer, not from environmental things or abuse or head injuries, but just because he wanted to. So yes, he would be a born killer. Prince continues to live out his days on death row in San Quentin, but the effects of his crimes remain in the lives of those left behind. He got excited killing people. He enjoyed that. and. Um, and that's a very sick person that does something like that. For him, it was a thrill to do what he did. Cleophas Prince is definitely an evil person, and uh, I know he he's controlled by the devil as far as I'm concerned, and um, he's gonna burn in hell when he does die.